Good evening. My name is Rudy North. Patrick Conan is a professor at the University of British Columbia School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. He is the author of several books, including Design Charrettes for Sustainable Communities, and has just completed newest work, Seven Rules for Sustainable Communities. And I was just handed this book before I came up, and to me, uh, the real reason why you probably want to read it isn't because of that fetching uh, title, but the subtitle, which is Design Strategies for the Post-Carbon World. Professor Conran is a champion of rethinking our communities to dramatically reduce our burden on the planet through such initiatives as promoting streetcar technology. Professor Conran. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, to start off an admission, I'm uh, really quite nervous. <laughs> I've, uh, I've never been asked to be fascinating for seven minutes <laughs> and fascinating for 400 people at the same time. It's kind of like the speed date from hell. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the ways we were offered to be fascinating was to figure out a person who in our life was inspirational, so I thought about that. And I've chosen my son, Will. There he is, he's 13 now, but he was five in that. And it was about that time when he uh, was crying in his bed at night, couldn't go to sleep. And I go in there and uh, like any good father, I try to calm him down and say, Will, what's the matter? He says, oh dad, it's, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And I says, well, what are you afraid of? He says, I'm afraid of global warming. And uh, like any good dad, I try to calm him down and I say, well, you know, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. And he looks up at me now, he's not just crying, but he's angry. And he says, that's easy for you to say. You'll be dead. <laughs> anyway, that was eight years ago. And, uh, you know, it's funny, but it's sad. It's really sad. And it had a big impact on me. Uh, quite seriously. So that day was really kind of a turning point for me because before that day climate change was kind of an abstraction for me but after that day it became very personal. Uh, it was because my son's future was at stake. And like many of us I wondered what I could do about it. I was just one guy. Uh, my first and perhaps the most rational answer was nothing. Uh, but then something changed my mind. I found a drawing produced almost 40 years ago, and there's a couple of people in the room who might be familiar with this drawing. It showed our region, how our region might look if it became a more livable place. This drawing represented what became a consensus vision for the livable region, where complete communities linked by transit provided options to the car, and where the green zone was protected, and where autonomous regional centers could grow. And here's the best part. That drawing was eventually converted to policy, and then it became the region we now live in. As a result, this region is by most measures the most sustainable place in North America. People here use land more efficiently, they use the bus more, they drive less, protect more green space, and it is the only, interestingly, Canadian region where average commute times went down, and this during the decade where population grew by 15%, and when no, free, no, no new freeways were built. I realized something else too. My travels taught me that people from other parts of North America wanted to copy our success. And what we did here did not just change our own world, but helped change dozens of other urban regions all across the US and Canada. And I also realized that this work was still going on, that public officials, citizens, activists, and developers were still working hard to protect these gains and make this region even better. So that helped. I figured out that I was lucky. I was lucky to work at UBC where I got actually paid to think and paid to try to make the change real and where I could work with hundreds of other people in the region already working on this incredibly important project. Uh, so all this brings me to why I think trams, some of you know I'm on a tram kick, 
uh, as crazy as this may sound, can save my son. I do this with great trepidation due to certain recent experiences. Uh, such as that provided by my charming friend Michael Geller, pictured here, who recently introduced me to Michael Shifter, the new director of planning at TransLink, as Patrick Condon. He does studies about transit, a subject he knows absolutely nothing about. <laughs> Charming. I think he meant I have no degree in transit planning, not that I know nothing about it. He might have even meant it as a sort of backhanded compliment. With Michael Geller, we live in hope. So I'm very nervous about making these claims, but I make them anyway because I think that it's important. You see, if by 2050 we can't cut our consumption of basically everything by 80%, my son will take the hit. But if we do make it, he will live in a region very different and possibly much better than the one we're in now. There is a precedent for a region that gets better as it gets more sustainable. It is this one. Most North Americans would have predicted that as this region got more populated, it would have more crime, more traffic, more pollution, and less open space, while the opposite has happened. But the next big jump is harder. We have to pretty much junk the car, or at least, or at least use it very much less. What does a world with fewer cars and much more walking and transit look like? Here is the not so surprising answer. This is a slide, by the way, that shows comparative com uh, analysis of what three billion will buy for SkyTrain in the upper one and what it could buy in trams, and what three billion buys in a bridge and a widened freeway out in Surrey and what it could buy in trams. The streetcar, sorry, it, the, the city that may emerge looks a lot like the city looked in the past before the car stole the streets from the pedestrians, bikes, and streetcars. This streetcar city still exists and can be revived easily, easily, but we have to spend the money wisely. We have just this decade to get it right. In these short 10 years, we have maybe 10 to $15 billion to spend on new transit projects. How we spend that money is crucial. I'd like the next slide here. Here's the reason why. Um, we need 800,000 new housing units during the next 40 years to accommodate the growth in our population. And what's shown in this demographic pyramid in the dark blue is the age cohorts that we can expect to see in 2050. What that shows is an enormous increase in the over 65 demographic and a requirement for 800,000 new housing units most of those will be for that group. In fact, tw by 2050, most everyone in our streets will be old. Last slide, please. <laughs> so now there's a bunch of boomers out there in the audience and some uh, Generation Xs, and these, this is really what you're going to be in a while. <laughs> by 2050, our population will double. The elderly will make up the biggest chunk of this increase. With life expectancy steadily in increasing, it's quite possible that even I might be here in 40 years. You better hope I'm not driving. <laughs> the most I will be able to do, is that the hook? Almost. Yeah. yeah, I can see. Oh, I'm over. So it's up to us to plan for that. At least I didn't use a hook. It's crucial we get it right. My son's life depends on it. After that, my crystal ball blurs, but at that point, my son, being over 50 himself, is on his own. Thank you very much. <laughs>